Uh, Madam Chair, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I'd like to thank the Commander of the Sri Lankan Army, Lieutenant General Mahesh Senanaika, and the Sri Lankan Army for putting on this excellent conference. Uh, in the US view, in my personal view, the topic is important and the timing is perfect, and it's been professionally run, especially the cultural show last night, which was the best I've ever seen. I wish Australia could do that well. So well done. Uh, you might have noticed a lot of smart people in the room that I'm not American, but I'm speaking for the United States. Uh, that's a deliberate choice of the United States, and it reflects what Admiral Fallon spoke about on the first morning, that a key component of a solution to most problems in the view of the United States is allies, partners and friends. And the US is serious about that. So you will find allied officers in the command chain across the United States military. I happen to be in US Army Pacific, but it's quite common across the combatant commands and also inside the services. So it might be a little bit strange, but it's not unusual. So this conference and the nations and organisations represented here attest to the reach and the threat posed by violent extremist organisations across the Indo-Asia Pacific and globally. Few nations are immune from the threat. So I went to school in Sydney and if you just said to me 17 years ago that Sydney would be subject to attacks by violent extremist organisations or individuals, I would have thought that almost impossible. Well, I was wrong. And m many of our places, whether it be Jakarta, Dakar, Marawi, Ottawa or San Bernardino or any of the other of our best loved places are likely to be subject to attacks from these organisations. This is an unavoidable aspect of the world and the region in which we live in 2017. The threat. Violent extremist organisations fundamentally threaten and target the sovereignty and gover the governance of sovereign nations. They can be simultaneously local, national, region, regional and or transnational threats. Given coalition success in both Syria and Iraq, there is now increased concerns for the return of fighters into our own region. And that must be taken seriously and counted. For example, we've observed a version of the ISIS methodology in the southern Philippines recently around Marawi. And that has incorporated fighters with multiply, uh, multiple backgrounds, affiliations and nationalities. Despite the diversity of many of the VEO, they exhibit similarities in narrative, method and purpose that, while always unique and need case-specific understanding, have similarities that make them vulnerable to a comprehensive counter-strategy. From their core narratives and appeal to their tactics, techniques and procedures, the good news is they can be counted, degraded, reduced, disrupted and ultimately defeated. Recent history would suggest, however, that achieving this objective is rarely simple, cheap, easy or risk-free. But there is light at the end of the tunnel or end of the tunnels. If you can't see it, dig. A summary of US strategy and the, and the approach that was described in outline by Admiral Fallon. The nature of the threat determines the nature of the US response. As uh, General Dunford, the uh, US Chairman of the Joint Staff stated when talking about ISIS, this threat is a trans-regional threat and we have a global approach. The US global approach is founded on the essential need for multinational, multi-level interagency collaboration, cooperation and shared commitment. Secretary of Defence Mattis explained it concisely. I emphasise this is a coalition approach. 
united in opposition, sharing intelligence, providing troops and funds for combat, combat and of no less importance for the post-combat recovery. Central to this is effective vertical and lateral local, regional, national and international integration to defeat the threat. This is kind of easier to say than it is to actually execute, as many people in the room will well understand, especially the soldiers. It requires determination, goodwill, the acceptance of risk, clear and sustained communication, plus a deep capacity to listen and to understand. A foundation enabler for this strategy is to grow, reinforce and support the network of like-minded leaders, nations, actors and organisations represented in this conference and beyond it. This conference is part of countering the threat. The US military contribution. So how, do, how does the US military contribute to that outline strategy against violent extremist operations? So it is one line of effort integrated and synchronised with the, the overall strategic approach. It includes many actions from the provision of direct and indirect military capabilities to deliberately operate against violent extremist organisations, but also to support the operations of partners and allies against common threat. And the military strategy extends well beyond combat operations. While we provide forces and support and target the threat directly, we also share intelligence and perhaps more importantly, knowledge about the threat and how to defeat it. We work as a joint and interagency US team, closely with our partners and allies to reinforce and improve institutional professional capacity to successfully counter violent extremist organisations. In a practical sense, what does this look like? Well, it's exercises, exchanges, subject matter expert teams, visits, education, training, officers at staff college. It is capability development, professional mentoring and institutional development, all put together with a multitude of regional and global partners. I'd like to emphasise one thing to you. This effort is not locked on transmit. It is not one way. We aim to share and increase our own US understanding and readiness to counter the threats to the United States by learning and understanding from our friends and your experiences. So the experience of Sri Lanka is directly relevant to us in how to counter the threat and operate against that particular enemy. For example, the Sri Lankan experience with IEDs and mines uh, gives them a base level of knowledge and experience that is valuable to other professional forces facing a similar threat. Let me give you a few practical examples of the US land forces execution of that strategy. You might see how it's done on a day-to-day -day basis. Example one is this conference. So we participate in it, we're proud to participate in it, because we think forums like this are important to share knowledge and experience across that allied partner and friend team. Trust and understanding are the currency of effective collaboration. And a central American belief is that engagement between key leaders, nations, organisations and people will build that trust that is so essential. A second example of how the US Land Force generates collaborative professional uh, response to this type of threat is growing forums where we exchange ideas, training from the practical to the theoretical level. One example is the Special Operations Command Pacific hosted multilateral counter violent extremist working group, which was last held in April 2017. It's an example of one important working group that began with just three nations, but this year had nine national participants. 
in this forum, a wide range of issues are discussed, not just direct action combat against the enemy, but topics included uh, what are the, addressing the seams between national and organisations across the region, understanding and countering the process of radicalisation, which has been a topic over the last couple of days here, and the design of collaborative solutions to counter and prevent violent extremism. A third specific example. We look at how the enemy operates and seek to collectively work out ways to counter and defeat it. And a good example is improvised explosive devices, a preferred highly destructive weapon and tactic of most violent extremist organisations. The US Army has the Asia-Pacific Counter ID Fusion Center, which operates across the region with multiple nations, forces and organizations who understand the IED threat. And this one small action represents the strategic approach because the APCFC activities include sharing intelligence and knowledge, data analysis, exploitation, Training and, uh, training and education, capability development, and the sharing of the intellectual framework, which we call defeat the network, how to attack that threat. So there's just a few examples. I'd like to conclude by talking about the future, because one of the seminal lessons that the US has learned from its uh, global operations in the last 17 years is the fight against violent extremist organisations is rarely static and it takes place in a rapidly evolving operational and informational context. We know we must learn and adapt. We know that if we do it together and learn off each other, we will do it more quickly and more effectively. One obvious challenge is dealing with the contemporary physically unconstrained, connected information environment. All indicators suggest that connections will continue to grow and expand quickly and globally. The threat operates, communicates messages and manoeuvres in this domain, and their operations in this realm are critical to their appeal, effectiveness and survival. We need to work together to learn how to operate in the world of continuous social media and 24-7 connectivity. I'll just conclude with a uh, few observations from my year last year in Iraq, fighting against Daesh uh, with the international coalition, Iraqi-led coalition in Iraq. Iraq taught me how quickly operations in the modern world are changing and how critical it is to understand this if we do proactively counter this threat, especially their narrative, the appeal and effectiveness. Daesh in Iraq in 2016 was a high-end threat who were organised, ruthless, innovative and information and audience savvy. Their tactical defeat has required large-scale conventional joint offensive manoeuvre. In case you don't know, core-level manoeuvre executed inside a sophisticated Iraqi-led and coalition-supported whole-of-nation and international approach. More capabilities than ever before can be brought to bear against this enemy. Military and non-military, kinetic and non-kinetic, interagency, multinational, international, civil society. They can and are now being globally sourced and applied tactically operationally and strategically, often simultaneously. The real practical challenge, in my view, for us in the 21st century is how to apply all of these capabilities in all domains in a coherent, synchronised, integrated or aligned approach that targets the vulnerability threat and re reinforces our friendly force and actor legitimacy credibility and appeal. This is very hard to do, and it remains a work in progress, constantly evolving in the real world. The US Army is looking very hard at this with the US Marine Corps, 
There'll be a new concept emerge in the near future called multi-domain battle, and it's about how to fight in the 21st century. So keep your eyes out for that, and you'll see the intellectual construct evolve. So in conclusion, one final point. There is no place for complacency in the 21st century challenge, which, and it only reinforces the central tenet of the pro proactive US approach. And it's, I'll end with a quote from, uh, in soldier speak from our senior sailor, the commander of the US Army Pacific, Admiral Harry Harris, who kind of summed it up. We must stop them at the front end and not the back end when the threat can become more dangerous. But we cannot do it alone. To halt the cancerous spread, we must work together with like-minded nations in the region and across the globe. Thank you.